You're live from New Delhi, you're watching Did India Live, India's Voice to the World. I'm Lipakshi Kurana, coming up in the next 30 minutes. Strongest criticism of Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu by US President Joe Biden as he calls his action a mistake, says he doesn't agree with his approach. Abortion rights back in focus as Arizona's top court revised a ban on abortions under a law from 1864. President Biden blames Republicans for ripping away women's freedom. Parents of a teenager who shot and killed four classmates in U.S. Michigan convicted of manslaughter, sentenced to between 10 and 15 years, a rare case of parents being held responsible in a school shooting. And voting underway in South Korea for the 22nd parliamentary polls, election seen as a referendum on President Yoon suk yeol Also, Muslims across the world celebrate the festival Eid al-Fitr, India to celebrate Eid on Thursday. News in detail now. U.S. President Joe Biden said Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's Gaza policy was a mistake and urged Israel to call for a ceasefire. In an interview to U.S. Spanish language TV channel, Biden calls for a ceasefire and a total access to all food and medicine going into Gaza. His remarks on a ceasefire marked a shift from his previous comments in which he has said the burden lies with Hamas to agree to a truce and hostage release deal. I think what he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approach. I think it's outrageous that those four or three vehicles were hit by drones and taken out on a highway where it wasn't like it was along the shore. It wasn't like there was a convoy moving here, et cetera. So I, what I'm calling for is for the Israelis to just call for a ceasefire allow for the next six, eight weeks total access to all food and medicine going into the country. I've spoken with everyone from the Saudis to the Jordanians to the Egyptians. They're prepared to move in. They're prepared to move this food in. And I think there's, there, there, there's no excuse to not provide for the medical and the, and, the, and, the, and the food needs of those people. They should be done now. Meanwhile, an in-person meeting of Israeli and U.S. officials on the planned operation in the Gaza city of Rafah are expected next week. There's constant communication happening every day, but as it relates to this particular conversation, when they're going to be here in person, uh, the members of the Israeli government, that's going to happen in a couple of weeks. Meanwhile, Israel says it is moving into Gaza more quickly after international pressure to increase access. It said 468 aid trucks moved into Gaza on Tuesday, following 419 on Monday. International pressure to increase access on Israel sharpened last week, including from its closest ally, the United States. White House has termed the substantial increase of aid into Gaza as good, but said is not good enough. The UK joined eight other nations in an international large-scale dropping of essential aid coinciding with the end of Ramadan. Participating countries include Jordan, Indonesia, United Arab Emirates, Netherlands, France, Germany, Egypt and the United States. Well, Arizona's top court on Tuesday upheld an 1864 law that bans nearly all abortions. The Arizona Supreme Court ruled 4-2 in favor of an anti-abortion obstetrician. The court, however, also put its ruling on hold for the moment and sent the case back to a lower court to hear additional arguments. The ruling was focused on a law on the books long before Arizona achieved statehood. It outlaws abortion from the moment of conception except when necessary to save the life of the 
mother and it makes no exceptions for rape or incest. Doctors prosecuted under the law could face fines and two to five years in prison. Also, Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs in her first remarks after top court's ruling said the ban is extreme and hurts women. Arizona's 2022 abortion ban is extreme and hurts women. And the near total Civil War era ban that continues to hang over our heads only serves to create more chaos for women and doctors in our state. As governor, I promised I would do everything in my power to protect our reproductive freedoms. While denouncing Arizona abortion ban, the U.S. President Joe Biden said on Tuesday that millions of Arizonans will soon live under an even more extreme and dangerous ban. Biden in a statement said this ruling is a result of the extreme agenda of Republican elected officials who are committed to ripping away women's freedom. And Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida will hold a summit with U.S. President Joe Biden, showcasing closer security and economic ties between the allies. Wednesday's summit is a historic upgrade in defense ties between the longtime allies in the face of China's growing might. Two leaders are expected to announce measures to enhance security cooperation to enable greater coordination and integration of forces. On Tuesday, U.S. President Joe Biden and the First Lady welcomed Japanese Prime Minister and his wife to the White House. Kishida is the fifth world leader honored by Biden with a state dinner since he took office in 2021. Kishida also addresses a roundtable on critical and emerging technologies hosted by the U.S. Chamber of Commerce in Washington. He said he saw opportunities for more collaboration with the United States in next-generation computer chips. Japan welcomes investment from the United States that push forward such cooperation in critical and emerging technology. The economic growth our country obtains through your investments shall serve as the funding source of further investments into the United States by Japanese entities. While the Prime Minister has also been invited to address a joint meeting of Congress on Thursday, he will be just the second Japanese leader to address the body. Shinzo Abe gave a speech to Congress in 2015. An island's parliament has elected Simon Harris as the country's new and youngest ever prime minister officially taking office in Dublin to succeed Leo Varadkar following his surprising resignation last month. Harris ran unopposed to replace Varadkar as leader of the ruling Fine Gael party and the final formalities were completed in the Dale Islands Parliament. He has held a number of government positions since being earmarked as a rising political star in his late 20s, most recently serving as the Minister for Higher Education and Science. Harris was elected to Parliament at 24 and appointed to Cabinet before he turned 30. Before Harris, Varadkar was the country's youngest ever leader when first elected at age 38. And the parents of the teenager who killed four students in the 2021 school shooting in Oxford, Michigan, James and Jennifer Crumbley, were each sentenced 10 to 15 years in prison weeks after being convicted of manslaughter. This is a rare case of parents to be held criminally responsible for a mass school shooting committed by their child. James and Jennifer, who each had faced up to 15 years in prison, have already been imprisoned for over two years since their arrest in the Detroit warehouse days after the shooting. Though they were tried separately, their sentencing took place together in an Oakland County courtroom. Ethan Crumbley's parents were sentenced immediately after several parents of the victims gave emotional statements in an Oakland County courtroom in Pontiac in Michigan. And voting is underway for the parliamentary polls in South Korea. Voting is seen as a referendum on President Yoon suk yeol The opposition Democratic Party, which already dominates the 300-member legislature, has hammered Yoon and his conservative People's Power Party for mismanaging the economy and failing to rein in inflation. PPP leader Han Dong-hoon said a big win by the DP, whose leader is facing corruption charges, would create a crisis for the country. He warned against giving the 
opposition an unprecedented supermajority of 200 seats. Yoon, about to enter the third year of his five-year presidential term, has been suffering from low approval ratings for months, having come to power in 2022, vowing to cut taxes, ease business regulations and expand family support in the world's fastest aging society. And member countries of the Organization of American States rejected the raid by Ecuadorian police of the Mexican embassy to arrest a former official. OAS Secretary General Luis Almagro said international law must be respected and diplomatic headquarters are inviolable. He also added that the raid could not be justified by internal laws. In the first extraordinary session of the OAS Permanent Council, Almagro also urged both countries to find a peaceful solution to disputes. A second extraordinary session of the OAS Permanent Council will be held today in Washington to find an amicable solution to the breakdown of bilateral relations between Ecuador and Mexico. And a Venezuelan former oil minister, Tarek El Aysami, has been arrested in a corruption probe into state oil company PDVSA. Former finance minister Simon Zerpa and businessman Sir Mark Lopez have also been detailed. El Aysami resigned in March 2023 amid a wide anti-corruption probe ordered by Maduro, which has been mainly focused on wrongdoing and PDVSA. El Aysami has not spoken publicly for more than a year. The three men are facing charges of treason, money laundering, conspiracy and misdirection of public funds. The case involves a network of PDVSA executives who use their positions to carry out illegal operations, including some involving cryptocurrencies. All of the men have been under sanctions by the United States since 2017, with al Aysami and Lopez facing drug charges. Well, Bolivian doctors went on a national strike on Tuesday to protest a retirement bill they claim will force them to retire when they turn 65 years old. Doctors started a 72-hour national strike with a march that was joined by teachers against what they call the forced retirement law the government wants to get passed in Congress. In Bolivia, the voluntary retirement age is set at 58 years old for men and 55 years old for women. Although the president of La Paz Medical College said doctors Doctors need to work longer to achieve a decent retirement pension. And an area of low pressure in the Atlantic Ocean brought coastal flooding, rough seas and rain to parts of England and western France early this week. Footage captured on showed huge waves crashing over a sea wall in St. Malo, France, flooding a street as passers by watchers watched on. Weather warnings were issued across Brittany upon reports Tom Perrick would bring strong winds to the region. Transport was disrupted in parts of Normandy and several regions in France were placed on orange alert. And Russia and Kazakhstan ordered more than 100,000 people to evacuate after swiftly melting snow swelled mighty rivers beyond bursting point in the worst flooding in the area for at least 70 years. The deluge of melt water overwhelmed scores of settlements in the Ural Mountains, Siberia and areas of Kazakhstan close to rivers. The Ural is Europe's third longest river which flows through Russia and Kazakhstan into the Caspian. A state of emergency was also declared in Truman, a major oil-producing region of western Siberia, the largest hydrocarbon basin in the world. And Biscuit Jatra is a famous festival celebrated in the Bhaktapur district of Nepal. It usually falls in April and marks the Nepalese New Year. During this festival, a chariot carrying images of various deities is pulled through the streets, accompanied by music, dancing and celebrations. The chariot procession during the festival involves carrying images of varying deities through the streets. Devotees participate in these processions to show their devotion and seek blessings from the divine. The Biscuit Jatra festival in Bhaktapur, Nepal is steeped in ancient beliefs and traditions. Biscuit Jatra marks the Nepalese New Year and is seen as a time of renewal and rejuvenation. The festival coincides with the spring season and the beginning of the agricultural cycle. It is believed to invoke blessings for a bountiful harvest and fertility in the land. 
and still to come in this edition of DD India Live. As the first phase of India's general elections approach, political parties intensify their efforts to attract voters, with leaders thronging to the ground to engage with the public and gain support. 12 killed in a tragic bus accident in central India's Durg President Prime Minister condoles loss of lives. Indian men's hockey team looked to bounce back against Australia in the third game, host Aussies lead the five-match series 2-0. Indian state of Tamil Nadu. Voting is our responsibility. This is a big fight between uh, BJP and uh, India Alliance. Will you vote? Ah, what do you Yeah, power of democracy. This is a huge. BJP is trying her best, you know, for the past 10 years under the flagship of uh, Sri Narendra Modi Garden. The 2024 Lok Sabha polls in Tamil Nadu are witnessing the battle royale between DMK, AIA DMK, and the BJP. Welcome back. You're watching DD News. I'm Lipakshi Kurana. Let's now get you the latest in the world's largest democratic election in India. Well, election season is at its peak in India with parties organizing multiple public meetings as the first phase of voting is slated for the 19th of this month. Prime Minister Narendra Modi is going to address public meetings in Vellore and Metupalayam in India's southern state of Tamil Nadu, followed by a meeting in Ramtek in the state of Maharashtra. India's Defence Minister Rajnath Singh will be addressing public rallies in Saharanpur, Buland Sheher and Sambhal in India's northern state of Uttar Pradesh. Uttar Pradesh is one of the three Indian states along with Bihar and West Bengal which will undergo voting in the second phase. India's Union Home Minister Amit Shah will be addressing rallies in West Bengal's Balut Ghat and Bihar's Aurangabad. Both West Bengal and Bihar will see voting in the all seven phases. Yogi Adityanath, Chief Minister of India's State of Uttar Pradesh, is scheduled to address a rally at Katua in the northern state of Jammu and Kashmir. Voting in Jammu and Kashmir is split into five phases. And the hearing of a PIL against the use of the INDIA acronym for the opposition group India National Developmental Inclusive Alliance is scheduled to be heard in Delhi's High Court on Wednesday. The Delhi High Court gave the opposition alliance a last and final opportunity of a week to reply to the PIL. Well, Andaman and Nicobar, along with Lakshwadeep, is truly India's hidden coastal treasure. Lakshwadeep is the smallest union territory in India, while Andaman and Nicobar is the maritime route in the Southeast Asian region. Let us take at the two archipelagos as they go to the polls on April 19th. The archipelago of Andaman and Nicobar Islands is one of India's union territories located in the Bay of Bengal, comprising about 836 islands spread over an area of 8,000 square kilometers. Situated approximately at a distance of about 1,400 kilometers from both the Indian cities Kolkata and Chennai, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are divided into three districts with Port Blair as the administrative capital. The group of islands rated high on the tourism list because of its natural beauty and pristine beaches has been seeing a surge in infrastructure upgradation works in the recent years. These include projects like underwater fiber optic projects, GPS motion sensors, automated weather stations, solar energy plants, tourism infrastructure and upgraded military bases. With a population of about 434,000, 
residing in 31 out of the over 800 islands, about 312,000 registered voters are exercising their franchise this time, which includes 162,000 males and about 149,000 female voters. Three voters are from the third gender category. During the 2019 elections, the lone seat was won by the Indian National Congress. The other prominent political parties in the archipelago are Bharatiya Janata Party, Two other parties including Bahujan Samaj Party and the left parties also participate in the polls. Election is being closely monitored in the Union territory which is strategically important for India, particularly because of its location, as its northern point is merely 22 nautical miles from Myanmar and the southern post point is about 90 nautical miles from Indonesia. The Andaman and Nicobar region is also an important maritime route in the Southeast Asian region. Well, in a tragic incident, at least 12 lives were claimed and 14 injured after a bus fell into a mine pit in central India's Durg district of Chhattisgarh on Tuesday. The bus carrying workers fell into a ditch around 8.30 in the evening. The workers belonged to a private distillery company of Durg and they were returning home when the bus met an accident. India's President Draupadi Murmu and Prime Minister Narendra Modi expressed their grief and condoled the lives of in an accident. Meanwhile, Chhattisgarh Deputy CM Vijay Sharma visited the injured at Ames Raipur in the wake of the accident. And now let's take a look at other stories making news today. India's President Draupadi Murmu will inaugurate a two-day homeopathic symposium on Wednesday on World Homeopathy Day 2024. Symposium will be organized by the Central Council for Research in Homeopathy under the Ages of Ministry of Ayush and is based on the theme of empowering research, enhancing proficiency. The event aims to promote holistic health and wellness and head towards utilization of advanced techniques for homeopathy research. An earthquake of magnitude 3.1 on the Richter scale hit Gujarat's Bhavnagar on Tuesday. The National Center for Seismology said the tremor shook the region. The earthquake caused a panic among residents. No immediate reports of damage or casualties have been received so far. A massive fire broke out at a four-story shop in Delhi's Gandhi Nagar Market on Tuesday night. The tenders reached the spot after receiving the information along with the senior officials. The Delhi Fire Service said no one was injured in the incident. The reason of the blaze is not yet known, but it is suspected to be a short circuit. Morning Aarti being performed in the second day of Navratri at Jandewala Temple on Wednesday. The first Aarti of the day at Jandewala Temple is called the Mangal Aarti. The devotees thronged the temple to offer prayers early morning. Navratra marks the beginning of the Hindu New Year. And on to some sports news now. Indian men's hockey team will take on Australia in the third game of the five-match series on Wednesday. Having lost the opener 5-1 and second match 4-2, India now trails the series 2-0. The five-match series, part of India's Paris 2024 Olympic preparation, concludes on April 13th. At the Olympics, India and Australia are placed in Group B of the hockey competition. India, which won the bronze at the 2020 Tokyo Olympics, will look to change the colour of the medical this time around. And in Indian Premier League, in a riveting contest, Sunrisers Hyderabad clinched victory by a narrow margin of two runs against Punjab Kings in Mulanpur on Tuesday. Chasing 183 for a win, Punjab could only manage 180 for six. Shishang Singh top scored 46 off 25 balls and Ashutosh Sharma also remained not out on 33 off 15 balls. Rajasthan Royals will square off with Gujarat Titans in Jaipur on Wednesday. Rajasthan have been unbeaten in their four matches so far. They are on top of the points table. On the other hand, Gujarat have lost three of the five matches and are at number seven. Well, that's all for this edition of DD India Live. But let us know your thoughts on the news of the day. You can connect with us on Facebook, X, formerly known as Twitter and Instagram. We'll be back with more news as it breaks here on DD India. I'm Lipak Shikurana from all of us here in Delhi. Thanks for watching DD India Live.
as India decides in the world's largest election. We help you feel the pulse of the nation. I am Sakal Bhatt. I am Shubhain Dukhosh. This election season, join us on a journey of India. Discover the colours of democracy. Watch Full Pulse on DD India.